My name is Dale Solomon, and I'd like to share the ups and downs of my life with you. I'm not especially proud or ashamed of what I've done. Life often presents difficult choices. I am the middle kid in a loving but financially strapped household with two sisters and two brothers, because of our low budget. I began working as a teenager despite being told that I am pretty intelligent. Most of my occupations were trivial, yet they allowed me to spend money. During my time in community school, I sold sperm and blood to supplement my income. Celeste and I met there during my sophomore year, and after six weeks of passionate closeness, we eloped. While she was an extremely creative partner, she had stringent boundaries, particularly in terms of our closeness. I never pressured her for an explanation. I worked 32 hours per week to qualify for benefits while still completing 14 credit hours of night studies. Celeste worked as a secretarial assistant in an insurance agency. Despite our combined wages, we struggled to save due to the high cost of education and living expenditures. Survival entailed keeping our sights set on a faraway destination. When financial difficulties became insurmountable, we decided that a temporary stay in the military could provide some relief. The benefits of the GI Bill appeared to be a potential long-term answer. However, Celeste notified me shortly after I started boot camp that she was pregnant. Fortunately, her parents agreed to help us with the baby when the time came. I was young, though I recognize it is not an acceptable reason. I was so disappointed that I never even considered checking. Celeste and I were married for two years when she gave birth to our son. If it was a female, we'd name her Gloria. We decided on the name Daryl Thomas ahead of time because it was a boy. Less than a month later, while still deployed, I received divorce papers. The divorce petition did not seek alimony or child support. The birth certificate was included, revealing that I did not have a son named Daryl Thomas Solomon. Instead, Celeste's co-worker, Wendell Truitt, was recorded as the father, and the child's name was Wendell True Jr., there were no provisions for visitation because I was not considered the child's father. My friends assured me that losing her was for the best, a point that was difficult to argue against. I'll do my best. I haven't spoken to Celeste since the day I received my divorce papers. It took a long time for me to rebuild my confidence and trust in women. But I did it. I met a woman who actually loves me. Nonetheless, our relationship was on the verge of ending. I met Dee Dee at a local BBQ. She happened to be the sister of one of my neighbors, whom I did not know very well at the time. Despite her sporadic attendance at past occasions, we had not interacted much. I was overly reserved. I'm still recuperating from my divorce, therefore I can't initiate conversation. Dee noticed my uncertainty and took the initiative. So, I heard you served. Yes, ma'am. And, you know, just a civilian. How long have you been back? Approximately nine months. Are you here alone today? Not only today. And you? Yeah, I am on my own. Simply trying to be social. What house are you from? I'm not a resident here. My sister is. She said, pointing at someone who bore little resemblance to her. So what brought you here? She replied with a sly gleam. Are you sure? I have seen you at a handful of these occasions. I see. Are you the only one who can be shy? So would you wish to leave? Get some ice cream and see a movie? I am Dale, by the way. I'd like that, Dale. You can call me D. As a result, we embarked on a journey that eventually led to cohabitation dating. Eight months later, Dee was preparing to take the bar exam and become a lawyer. After finishing my bachelor's degree, I landed a managerial position at a distribution center. We leased a house in a typical suburban neighborhood. We occasionally took weekend trips to Las Vegas. Life felt fulfilling, despite the fact that we both avoided discussing marriage. I must say that I was absolutely oblivious of the issue. After agreeing to attend a neighborhood meet and greet, I found myself roaming through the backyard. Dee could not attend owing to work, so I came alone. The only thing I needed to avoid was our neighbor, Bevan, who is known for her flirting demeanor, which irritates Dee Dee because she openly tries to attract him. I don't care what you do. Just don't spend any time alone with Bevan. Understood? Yes, sir. Or ma'am, darling, I responded, saluting Dee. I skillfully avoided Bevan during the event. Randy and Harley, the new couple, were dressed casually, with Harley not wearing a bra, and I guessed she wasn't wearing underwear underneath her short skirt. She was quite direct in her interactions, rubbing her chest against everyone, regardless of gender. 
While Randy appeared unconcerned as the party wound down and some men went AWOL, I realized I had completed my social role. After directing another guest into the house, I tapped Randy on the shoulder to say goodbye. Are you sure you have to leave, Dale? Things are heating up in the bedroom, if you get my drift. Yes, I am sure. Welcome to the neighborhood. Please send my respects to Harley. Follow me throughout the house. You can escape by the front door. I walked alongside Randy, catching echoes of intimacy in the air. Randy grinned from ear to ear. We passed close enough to see a few men standing naked, Harley's words carried playing a provocative role. I merely smiled and continued walking. If only I had known I could have been more prepared for the turmoil that followed later that evening. You are a terrible jerk. How could you? Dee yelled, clearly upset. How could I? What? Sleeping with our new neighbor? Bevan stated that each man at the party took advantage of her. That is not true. I deliberately avoided Bevan and never saw Harley beyond the first hour or so. I heard her as I was leaving. Ask Randy. I did not participate. That is not what Bevan said. She said you walked out of her bedroom with a broad grin on your face. Take your belongings to the guest bedroom. You are not sleeping with me tonight. That night signaled the beginning of the end. Things never go back to normal. Randy and Harley were swingers, offering free samples to new acquaintances that afternoon. After two months of cohabitation but effectively having different lives, I informed them that things had to improve or I would leave. Looking back, if our relationship was definitely going to end, this was the ideal time. We had contemplated getting married and starting a family, but not having children would make the separation easier. The only surprise was how quickly disaffection grew into anger over the words of someone she despised. If she was that emotionally unstable, perhaps I should consider myself fortunate that we split up when we did. However, conveying it to my emotions was a quite different story. I found a new apartment and moved. It wasn't surprising that Bevan left a message on my phone requesting we meet up. I decided not to return her call. The last thing I needed was to deal with a manipulative nymphomaniac. I had been living alone for over a year when my heart skipped a beat. I hadn't bothered to delete these contact details from my phone when it vibrated on Saturday night and Dee's name appeared on the caller ID. I was caught off guard. My stomach constricted. My heart raced and my palms sweated. What could she possibly want? Allowing it to go to voicemail seems to be the easiest option. Hello, Dale. I was wondering if you wanted to meet up sometime. I owe you an apology, and I'd rather do it face to face. I was finished with her. Why should I satisfy her by relieving her conscience? Though I still had deep feelings for her, I knew better than to rekindle the connection. I replied simply, no thank you. This provoked a, why not, from her. I could have responded, because I despise you. I could have said, you are not worth my time. I could have said you were crazy. Instead, I stayed mute. Sunday morning, I awoke to a torrent of text messages from D. If I don't meet her, she repeatedly threatened to disclose her guts through text messages. They proceeded. Randy and Harley clearly note their interactions with others. A divorce attorney became aware of this and launched a lawsuit. The video evidence presented in court provided information about the individuals involved. Contrary to what I said that day, I was not among them. Finally, she believes me and regrets her actions. While I hadn't been watching Dee since our breakup, I determined to mirror her actions. It does not matter right now. I've heard you've been rather promiscuous recently. I couldn't be with someone like that. Have a happy life, Dee. Dale, this is not true. Who told you this? I am not promiscuous. Allow her to be angry. I did not respond. My phone started ringing soon after, so I turned it off. Talk about hitting a nerve. I should have been counting. Easily. I received dozens of texts and voicemails which were all ignored. She was desperate to save her reputation. How could I possibly consider the possibility that it was true? After two weeks, the texts and calls stopped. I sorry. I understand now. I made an unfounded claim that you could not possible fight against. I finally understood you'd received the same treatment from me. I let go of a decent man and now regret it. I will leave you alone. I still adore you, D. A week later, I decided to meet up with Dee for drinks. Her latest text had undermined my resolve. Part of me wanted to get out of here, but the dumb part insisted that everything was under control. Dee went all out for our meeting. Though she usually dresses conservatively, 
Her choice of a push-up bra and a low-cut shirt highlighted her considerable cleavage. The bra she wore appeared to be purposefully designed to disclose a bit of her areas, and the slight prominence of her nipples was difficult to ignore. She smirked and added, My eyes are up here, Dale, and they captivate D. You made sure I couldn't ignore them, because it would have been impolite of me to do so. How have you been? I replied, Hopeful. And you? She inquired, still dubious. What do you want to drink? White wine as usual has not changed. Do you think the skirt is too short? She inquired. One would expect her to keep her legs together, but she appeared to have abandoned that idea in her purposeful endeavor to activate my hormones. The sight of a woman's naked inner thigh is usually appealing. It might be too short for church, but it's typical for a bar like this. Is this your first time here? I asked. Yes, I came wanting to meet someone like you. And you? Are you a regular here? She replied. Yeah, I added. This is my favorite spot for meeting people which elicited a slight reaction from her. I smirked back, intending to add that I have reason to assume you are committed to your significant other. Am I invading on your current relationship? She inquired. Did I mention that half of me was screaming, Run! Since our breakup, I'd had a couple one-night stands. There was no way I was prepared for a relationship, not even with D. I decided to be truthful. No, my heart isn't trusting any woman right now, it could be months or even years before I can tolerate the anguish again. These eyes welled up immediately. I'm so sorry, Dale. Would you be open to a friends with benefits arrangement to keep me in your thoughts? She knew she had me. I squirmed uncomfortably in my chair, my desire throbbing against my jeans. I need to get some condoms beforehand. She winced again, then began. But you don't have to. You okay? Your location or mine? Let us go to your place. That way I can leave if required. I settled the bill and hurried to the pharmacy. They greeted me in a robe when I arrived. After removing my coat, she threw her arms around my shoulders, allowing the robe to fall open. She was naked and quite appealing. I caressed her breasts and teased her nipples. Her arousal was visible, oozing down her legs. I am here for your pleasure. Simply tell me what you want and I will make it happen. By the time the sun rose above the horizon... I had examined all three of her openings. This is a first for me. D represented all a man could desire, sensual, passionate, attentive, and patient. But it wasn't enough. I found myself succumbing to her allure at least twice every week. D, I understand your desire to reconnect, but I must admit that the connection we once had has faded. Perhaps I need assistance in determining why I've become so emotionally disconnected. I don't want to lead you on. While the intimacy is enjoyable and your disposition great, I can't manage to rekindle our profound passion. Dale, I've seen a shift in you. I am willing to give you time to rediscover yourself. I accept partial blame for the situation. I stopped initiating contact, but Dee persisted. She kept me updated on her life and continued to invite me to spend the night. My lack of interest was not limited to Dee alone. I knew that I needed support to overcome my despair. My psychotherapist, Dave, made tremendous progress and urged me to include Dee in a few sessions. He was direct with her, emphasizing her unwillingness to totally trust me, which made her cry. As a result, she sought personal counseling. We gradually restarted our friends with benefits dynamic, and I see the prospect of rekindling a meaningful relationship. After five years of divorce from Celeste, I received a message from her at my parents' place, Curiosity pushed me to call her back, despite the fact that I had no reason to do so. Several days later. Hello, Celeste. I'm Dale. You rang. Thank you for getting back to me. Wendell and I would like to discuss something serious with you. Could we meet up? I will treat you to dinner. I arranged to meet in a neighboring cafe. D accompanied me. Celeste. He arrived with Wendell, the man she introduced as her husband. She appeared well-dressed and outgoing. After we placed our order, she handed me an envelope. Dale, I have something to confess and a favor to request. When I had the baby while still married, I named Wendell as the father. However, it turns out he isn't. You'd squeezed my hand. My heartbeat quickened and my gut constricted. Are you not going to say anything? What is your request, Celeste? Wendell Jr. needs a bone marrow donor, and I hope you'll agree to be tested for compatibility. The DNA test reveals that Wendell is not the father and you are the only other option. The test results. And this envelope contains Wendell Jr.'s medical report. Please consider assisting. 
I had been giving to the sperm bank long before we met. I may have fathered several, if not more, children, but never met them. What makes you assume that your child deserves more of my time and attention than they do? He was conceived naturally. Doesn't this signify anything? Not for me. Your child is just like any other child I've fathered. I have no emotional connection with any of them. If one was born to a deceptive, adulterous woman, so be it. If that is all you have to say, I must return to my duties. Please don't insult my wife, Weasel interjected. Celeste squeezed his hand. Ignore him, Wendell. We have no control over his actions if he chooses to go to that level. I turned to Wendell and proceeded. Weasel, have you slept with her yet? I just got the chance after finding her with her lover's penis deep inside her. Then I was permitted. Frankly, I didn't like it. She too lacks expertise in that area. Wendell, this is not true. I have never cheated on him. There was no sweetheart. He is lying. He never touched my backside. Dee broke out laughing and mocked Celeste. Dick, I never cheated with you. It was not deemed cheating. Celeste was almost shouting. Damn you, bitch. Dale, how could you abandon your son? This is the deal, slut. I will look into the possibilities of checking to see if any of my unknown children are sick. If there is anyone out there whose mother was not a lying cheat. Alexis, the youngster. Does this work for you? When Wendell interjected, I stood up and started walking for the door. Dale, we need your help. Please chat to us. What does it take to update my son's birth certificate to reflect me as his father, then rename him Daryl Thomas Solomon? Once that's completed, I'll consider assisting. Until then, do not worry me. I left while they pleaded with me to stay and negotiate how to break the stillness. Asked, What are you thinking, Dale? That you are a far better woman than the other one. Are you thinking about aiding the boy? His name is Daryl. Do you still distrust me? I apologize if I trust you on this. Will you marry me? It may become complicated. I asked you a question. I weighed my alternatives. We had made considerable progress in treatment, and I genuinely liked her. What the heck? Yes, I will marry you if you help me with this. Can you complete the papers for the name change and birth certificate? I'd be pleased to. That evening's free sex with D was the finest. She insisted that the first load be in her ass. She normally orgasms before I do, so it works out well for both of us. The next day I had errands to run, but D had arranged for the paperwork to be delivered by courier. Celeste and Wendell were urged to sign the forms in front of a notary and then schedule a follow-up meeting. A DNA testing kit was also given, allowing me to establish whether Daryl was my child. We didn't meet with them again until the next day. Thank you for joining us today. Have you brought the signed papers? D asked, keeping a professional demeanor. Yes, it's inside the envelope. And here's Daryl's DNA test swab. Wendell said, I suggest we postpone submitting this paperwork until all medical procedures are completed. I have a form for you to complete detailing how medical bills will be managed. My investigation reveals that you have a two-year-old daughter, I added. Yes, Audrey referred to last month. When will you be tested, Dale? Celeste inquired. I reacted as soon as my counselor gave the green signal. Later that evening, I informed Dee about the documentation I needed completed. This is against my instincts. But I trust you, Dale. I hope whatever you plan is both legal and successful. Have I told you how much I adore you? Dee said. Soon you'll love me just as much as I love you, I teased. You may wish. You'll never catch up to me, Dee said jokingly. Another day passed and we found ourselves seated around a meeting table. Thank you for joining us. I'm not sure if I want to help, Dee admitted. Celeste pleaded with Dale. Kindly refrain from making such statements. His condition is deteriorating and he desperately needs your support. Do you believe Daryl is fond of his sister, Audrey? Yes. And does Audrey feel the same way for her brother, Daryl? Yes. It would be unfortunate to separate them if you agreed to the bone marrow surgery. Then you must hand over complete custody of both children to me. Separating the siblings would be too traumatic. I do not believe that allowing you visitation rights for the first two years will be useful. Allow the children to adjust to their new caretakers. Wendell erupted. I won't let you take my daughter. Sorry, scumbag. You took my child. What is the distinction? I did not take him. Celeste informed me that I was the father. It's hard to believe, right? You were duped by a deceptive, lying woman. Did you realize she was married when you began sleeping with her? Wendell stayed mute. Come on, you piece of crap. Answer that dang question. Yes, I understand. So it's okay for you to marry another man's wife. You have quite the moral compass. 
You both deserve each other. Do you need my help? Sign over the children. D has the documentation ready for you. Celeste swallowed back tears. Dale, how could you be so cruel? Look at the mirror, slut. You will notice cruelty looking back at you. When you're ready to proceed, bring the signed documents together with the children. Wendell and Celeste wept into each other's arms as Dee and I left the room. Dee stayed abnormally silent, which deeply disturbed her. You're revealing a side of yourself that is completely new to me. You appear to have a lot of pent-up wrath. I commented. I reached a breaking point. My voice started low, but I quickly started shouting. What gives you the impression? I fell in love, got married, and then joined to support my family. I was following a script, so what do I get? My heart broke. Could you relate to that, right? You cannot. I did all I was supposed to do. Was this enough? No. I'm treated like garbage, and my heart is once again stomped on. They now tell me that I have a son who has been taken from me. Could you relate to that? I doubt it. You're correct. Maybe I am overreacting. What was I thinking? Allow me to take a big breath and stop acting like a child. Perhaps being together isn't such a fantastic idea. I began to rise when D.H. exploded at me with the same volume and force as before. Sit. Are you not leaving? I apologize. I've been trying to make things up to you. I botched up. I know it. You already know it. I was not questioning you. I simply wanted you to talk with me. And I suppose I've succeeded. Perhaps now you can find some closure. Yes. Celeste treated you cruelly, and so did I. I decided to trust you, but you have an advantage over me. I don't know where this is heading or what we're going to do with two kids, so please forgive me if I appear concerned, but I believe I am entitled to know what your plans are. When I responded, tears welled up in both of our eyes. I apologize. You make a valid point. Grab your pencil and pad and let me tell you what I hope will happen. I presented my next demand. D got more attentive. That evening, we hoped to outperform our prior performance in bed. I wasn't completely confident Celeste and Wendell would give up. It just took two days to give over the children to Dee. I had never seen two adults cry that much. Dee and I escorted the children to the cafeteria and waited. About 15 minutes later, I received word that Celeste was on her way to the parking garage. We apprehended them with the children in tow. Audrey rushed up to Celeste and Wendell, greeting them like long-lost friends. I assumed you didn't want us to see them for two years. I never intended to file for custody. I wanted you to express your affection for your children. The documents are written in such a way that I could file them with the court before they reach 18. If I find out that those children have been abused, I will go to court to take them away from you. But are you still dealing with the medical issue? Nope. I had myself tested the day after we first met. I am as incompatible as can be. My blood type immediately disqualified me as a donor for the boy. It also proves that I am not Weasel Jr.'s father. It turns out you were promiscuous all along, right? Wendell seems bewildered and puzzled. Celeste exclaimed, That cannot be. So now you're also a medical specialist. I recommend you identify his biological father or hope that someone appears on the donation registry. However, because to privacy rules, I don't know who saved Wendell Jr., he spent 11 weeks in the hospital before returning home with Celeste and Wendell. They stayed in touch because she constantly hopes for a positive conclusion. I kept my pledge by proposing to Dee. We, particularly me, still have some unresolved difficulties. Dave, our personal counselor, has committed countless sessions to helping me handle my bottled-up rage and assisting Dee in dealing with me. Dee and I have two daughters. Celeste and Wendell tried to conceive another Wendell Jr. twice, but it did not happen. Wendell Jr. now has three sisters, and the couple could not have been more deserving. Despite the availability of DNA matching services, I have yet to discover any of my sperm donor progeny. I believe it will only be a matter of time before they seek my assistance. I will do whatever is necessary. D and I shredded all of Celeste's paperwork, most likely without fanfare this time. I was simply being rude, even though I felt entitled to do so. Here is the next story. I stood at the window watching the car back down. The car turned right and disappeared down the street. I questioned why I wasn't more upset. I'd just seen ten years of my life drive away. Shouldn't I have felt something? Shouldn't there have been more than just a shrug? Well, I guess I should go and take care of that dripping faucet. As I turned and headed for the kitchen, I ran the events of the last half hour back through my mind. I'd come home from work to find my wife, Peggy, sitting at the kitchen table with a full glass of wine sitting in front of her. 
I knew something was up as soon as I saw her sitting there. First she was home before me and she never got home from work until a half hour to an hour after I did. Secondly, the understanding we had was the first one home would start dinner and there was nothing on the stove. Lastly, there was the glass of wine. Peggy rarely drank. I was no sooner in the room than she asked me to sit down and told me she had something to say. I grabbed a beer out of the fridge, sat down across from her and she said, Rob, I know you know this. There has been something out of sync between us for the last six months or so. I have no idea why we seem to be moving away from each other. I don't know if it is something to do with me or something to do with you, but something is wrong. I've tried to talk with you about it, but all I get from you is that we are just going through a rough spot and it will get better. I decided that we need to separate. I'm not talking divorce, just a separation for a while. I think I need some space, Rob. I need to get away. Look at my life and see if I can figure out where the disconnect between us is coming from. You can use the time we are apart to look at the same thing from your angle. Come on, Peg. It isn't that bad. Sure, we are having some problems. What? Marriage doesn't. But two people can't work out problems if they're away from each other and not talking. Talking isn't going to help, Rob. You only see one problem with our marriage. As far as you're concerned, the only problem we have is that we aren't making love. Your solution to the problem is for me to get naked and let you have your way with me. As far as I'm concerned, there is a lot more wrong. We don't make love anymore because I don't want to. We don't snuggle or cuddle anymore because I don't want you touching me. And I don't know why. I don't want you to touch me. I still love you. I love you as much as I did on the day we were married. But something is wrong. And I don't know what it is. I need some space, Rob. I need some time alone so I can figure things out. So you want to pitch ten years of marriage out the window? No, Rob. I just think we need to spend some time apart. I've already packed my stuff in my car. I'm going to stay with my sister until I can find me a place. I'll call you once a week to keep in touch. She stood up and said, I have to go. I told Mary that I'd be there by seven. She turned and walked away without even offering to kiss me goodbye. And that in itself told me where I stood. It didn't take long for the word to get around that Peggy and I had separated. Most of our friends were sympathetic and went out of their way to try and cheer me up. Peggy called me once a week and asked me how I was, and I would say I was managing. And then I'd ask her how she was, and she would say that she was okay. Then I would ask her if she were ready to come home yet, and she would tell me. Not yet. Peggy had been gone for six weeks when I started hearing things. Disturbing things. Things like she had a live in boyfriend. I didn't want to believe that. I wanted to believe that things were like she said they were. That she just wanted some time alone to get her head straight, and then she would be coming home. I kept hearing things, so I decided to check out the rumors and find out where Peggy was staying. Do a little snooping and put the rumors to rest. But no one could tell me where she was staying either, couldn't or wouldn't. And I began to think that something about the situation stunk to high heaven. I was having dinner with my friend Tom and his wife Tanya, and I voiced my concerns and let slip that I was going to hire a private detective to find Peg and either confirm the rumors or disprove them. I saw Tom look at Tanya and I saw her give him a little nod. Save your money, Rob. Tom said the rumors are true. Most of the people who know you know what is going on, but they like you too much to tell you. Tell me what? That Peggy left you to live without him. White. Adam White. Who the hell is Adam White? I've never heard of him. He works with Peggy and she just up and left me to go and live with him. That doesn't make sense. If she was going to do that, why didn't she just divorce me? What's with the separation bullshit? You know, Peggy Rob, she plans, makes fallback plans, and then makes plans for the fallback plan doesn't work. She has been seeing White for almost a year, and I guessing that she did the separation thing so she could come home if living with White wasn't as good as having an affair with him. And everyone knows this, but no one would tell me. Gosh, golly, what a great bunch of friends I have. I stood up and threw my napkin down in the center of the table and said, Thanks, bunches. I'll see myself out. And I left their house on the drive home. I thought about what I had just learned. Peggy and I had no sex for more than a year because she refused to make love with me. She refused to let me touch her for over a year so we didn't snuggle. And the entire time she was hanging horns on me like a fool. I sat at home like a good young boy, behaving properly while waiting for the unfaithful 304 to return home, and all of my amazing pals were aware of the situation. 
and they simply let me sit there, staring at the walls and waiting. Well, the wait was over. The next morning, I scheduled an appointment with the Corliss Investigative Agency and paid them a retainer. I informed them where Peg was, and this white guy worked and told them I wanted all the dirt they could find on the two. Then I went home and began preparing a list of everything I needed to do to end my relationship with Peggy. I'd wait until I received the detective agency's report, but once I did, I'd have my list ready. Once the list was completed, I sat back and considered what else I needed to do. I hadn't gotten laid in about six months, what with Peg refusing me for a year and then the split. I'd been a fully loyal spouse, but now that I knew what Peg was doing, I wasn't going to be celibate for long. I was sitting at the kitchen table having a beer and making plans to break my extended dry spell when I remembered what Tom had said about Peg. She had everything planned out. After living with her for so long, I knew this was true. That implied to me that she had plans for what she would do if I discovered what she was doing. Plans were predicated on how she expected me to react to finding out. The biggest plan of all. How to stick it up. If she decided she genuinely wanted to live with White. I could envision her keeping an eye on me in case I went out and dipped my wick, which she could use against me in a divorce. All of a sudden, the list I had made was useless because she might have anticipated my reaction. It was back to the drawing board, and a fresh list emerged. And as it took shape, I realized that a lot of what I wanted to do needed to be done right immediately, rather than at the last minute. And there were some things I could do to stick it up, peg the bomb, and make her bleed. I grinned at the concept and wondered if she had a plan in case something like that occurred to her. The next morning, I went to my bank to deposit my paycheck, and while there, I checked the safe deposit box that Peg and I had. I noticed from the sign-in log that Peg checked the box at least once a week, and when I saw it, I knew she was keeping an eye on me and would pounce as soon as I showed signs of being onto her. I paused for a moment before removing the five certificates of deposit from their plastic envelopes and going upstairs to copy them all on the bank's copy machine. Then I returned the copies to their envelopes and placed them back in the box. Unless Peg took the CDs out of the envelopes to inspect them, she would have no idea about the switch. Then, knowing Peg was keeping an eye on me, I withdrew my passport from the box and casually said to the bank employee as she put the box back in its slot that I was heading down to Mexico on a fishing trip. I left the bank carrying five CDs in my pocket. On average, I went to the bank twice a week, cashing in one CD or paying the early withdrawal penalty before hiding the cash at home. I was skeptical of credit cards because I believed they could lead to trouble. So the only cards I had in my name were American Express, for which the entire sum had to be paid. When you received the statement, it included three petroleum company credit cards and one Visa card with a low limit. That was in my name solely. Peg, on the other hand, had perhaps a half dozen credit cards in her name, some with high limits. I knew what the restrictions were because I paid my bills every month, and I compiled a note of the remaining account balances and saved it. I would be sure to pay the minimum on such cards to maintain them in good standing. I sat down and prepared a list of everything I wanted, and then I went online and spent the next few weeks on a spending spree with Peg's credit cards. When I bailed, she would be left with the credit card debt which I expected to be substantial. I upgraded my computer to a new Dell with all the bells and whistles. I bought a Remington 700 on eBay, along with a digital camera and a cutting-edge cell phone that did everything but cook my dinner. The residence had pigs. It had been left to her by her parents, so I would have no claim to it. However, we had used it as collateral for an open line of credit. When we installed the swimming pool and hot tub, both of our signatures were on the account. We had paid off what we had borrowed, but the line of credit remained open. If I timed it correctly, I could draw on that line before she realized what I was doing. I had puzzled why, when she decided we needed a trial separation, she packed everything and left me at her house rather than asking me to leave. I knew that if I stayed in the house, I would naturally anticipate her to return. I would clearly perceive the separation as temporary. Next, I closed out my 401k at work, paid the penalty, and squirreled away the money. Then I sat back and waited for the private detective's report. I couldn't figure out how to get my ashes moved. I couldn't take the possibility that Peg had someone watching me in case I went looking. I figured I'd have to leave town on weekends to go fishing. She knew I loved to fish and went pretty frequently, 
and she knew from the catches I brought home that I did indeed go fishing, so I doubted she'd hire a private investigator to follow me. There's no need for her to get carried away. Right. After all, was I not stupid? Hadn't she been deceiving me for the past year? It was a Friday, and I was just about to leave work when Tanya called and asked me to stop by their house on my way home. I tried to beg off, but she insisted that it was important, so despite my strong reservations, I agreed to go. When I arrived, she allowed me in and took me to the living room where I discovered Tom reclining in an easy chair. He got up and extended me his hand, which I shook. He then advised me to sit down and relax while he grabbed me a beer. Tanya needs to speak with you, Rob, and you need to know that I completely agree with what she is going to say. He left the room and went to the kitchen while I questioned Tanya. Look, and she responded, In a minute, Rob, you'll need some beer for this. Tom returned and offered me a Bud Light, saying, I have some errands to run and will probably not be back before midnight. Catch you later. And he moved towards the front door, which I heard open and then close behind him. The door closed. Tanya indicated that she was ready to begin speaking. Rob, you've heard us. You stormed out of her the night you came here for dinner. I began to say something, but she raised her hand and said, Let me finish. You were justified, but it still hurts. In her defense, I can only say that we really like you, and we did not want to be the ones who damaged you. It gets a bit awkward because we're also friends with Peg, and we were hopeful she'd get her act together and return home. We knew you loved her, or at least used to love her, but we weren't sure if it was enough to make you forgive her. So we stayed quiet. If you got back together and didn't know... You might have moved on with your lives without worrying about forgiving and forgetting. That is it. That is our apologies. But that isn't the only reason Tom and I wanted you to visit by. We know you, Rob, and we know the type of guy you are. You wouldn't cheat on your wife any more than you would rob a bank. How long has it been since you had sex? The question caught me completely off surprise. For the first time, I saw Tanya's outfit. She wore a low-cut top with generous cleavage, a short skirt, and high heels to highlight her amazing legs, and whether I had a friend or not, I couldn't help but develop a hard-on. Then I recalled Tom's. I was completely on board with the comment, and I knew where it was heading. I told her with a low voice that it had been a year and a half. She leaned toward me, and I caught a glimpse down inside her top as she huskily stated, I'd like to change that, Rob. Tom is my friend, Tanya. I cannot do that to him. I tried to stand up, but she grabbed my arm and pulled me back down. Tom is fine with this, Rob. That is why he left. To give us some time alone. This is not a pity. Sex. Tom and I have discussed this for months. Now. You have something we desire, so I hope I can help you and you can help us. I do not comprehend what you were saying. To be blunt, Rob, Thomas is sterile, and we want a child. We want you to give me one. I was stunned. I sat there and stared at her, speechless. When I finally found my voice, I responded, You just said you knew I wouldn't cheat on Pig. Yes, she said, laying her fingers on the bulge in my trousers. But that was before you realized what Peg was doing. Now that you know, you are free from your vows to her. Why me? We want it to be someone we know, not an anonymous sperm donor. We will also want you to be involved in the child's life. You will be his godfather and will be always around his Uncle Rob. This does not make sense, Tanya. Of course it does. What if something happens to Tom and I? Who better to care for the child than Uncle Rob? On the bad side. God forbid. What if the youngster needed a liver transplant or something similar? Can we find the anonymous sperm donor? Even if we did what he suggested, how long would we have to wait for a donor who was a match? No, Rob. We have considered it out. We want you to be part of our family. On the other side of the coin... Are you going to tell me you don't think me attractive? She stared at me, began stroking me, and said, This says you do. And then she drew me close to her and said, There are advantages to being the father of my child, Rob. We will have to make love several times to ensure that I become pregnant. I will not limit you to the days when I am most fertile. In fact, I won't even tell you when they are. It could take several weeks, Rob. Weeks and weeks. And how long have you been without? She whispered, We will help each other, Rob, as her lips tightened around my neck. It had been a long time for me, and I knew I wasn't going to be around long. Now we can go into the bedroom and start creating babies. 
Tanya said that all of my qualms about what was going on had vanished around the time she gave me a breast job, so I got up and followed her to her bedroom. We watched each other undress before Tanya sat on the bed and spread her legs wide. According to what I've read, the hotter the intercourse, the more susceptible the womb is to the invasion of sperm. No loving and tender nonsense, Rob. It makes my blood rush, make me scream, plead, and screw my brains out. She reached down and pulled, saying, Have sex with me, breed me. I hopped onto the bed and had some fantastic sex. I believe that was far superior to having sex with a pig as quickly as possible. Tanya grabbed a cushion and stuffed it under her bun to elevate herself, allowing my sperm to flow into her. Looking at her lying there, pulled up like that, caused my staff tool to harden. And as I slipped into her for the second time, I hoped it would not be too long until I could return and do it again. When I came out of her, she placed the pillow under her buttocks again, and then she said, I did Tanya one more time before I left to go home. And just before she let me out the front door, she kissed me and thanked me for what I'd done. I want to do it every day till I become pregnant. But Tom is used to making love three or four times a week. And while he is fine with it, I refuse to offer him sloppy seconds. Call me tomorrow. Okay. I thought about what had just happened all the way home, and as I pulled into the driveway, I realized that if Peg was keeping an eye on me, she would learn about my visits to Tom and Tanya's and see that Tom went, but I lingered for several hours after. The next morning I called Tanya and told her what was going on, but she told me not to worry because no one would see Tom go because he didn't. He went downstairs to his basement workshop and remained there until I departed. That knowledge made me hesitate. It was one thing to make love to Tanya while Tom was away, but could I do it knowing he was in the house? Tanya must have understood what I was thinking since she sat. Do not worry, Rob. It will be okay, I promise. That afternoon, Tom called and asked me to join him for a drink after work. Talk about awkwardness. Try sitting down with a person you've known for 20 years who is a good buddy and whose wife you've just duped with his knowledge. He must have understood what I was thinking. So he got straight to it. I understand this is awkward for you, Rob. Hell, friend, it's awkward for me, but I need to talk to you about our predicament. First and foremost, I told you this when I left you and Tanya alone. I am completely fine with it. I mean it, Rob. However, I have to inform you that Tanya did not tell you the whole truth. I know she told you she wanted a kid and that I was sterile, but I also know she did not tell you the rest of it. To be blunt, friend, I can't get it up. I haven't been able to make love with Tanya in over a year. My God, that explains why she was so hot last night. She was playing catch-up and telling me she didn't want to give Tom sloppy seconds was her attempt to compensate for his ineptitude. She didn't want me to know he was impotent because she didn't want me to judge him negatively as a man. Not that I would have, but she did not know. What a contrast between her and Peg. Tanya prioritized Tom even under adverse circumstances, but Peggy just focused about herself. I'm not sure if that came through to you last night. Tom carried on. However, Tanya is a highly sexual person. Her inability to perform was driving her up the wall. Rob, she's trying hard to keep it together, but she would eventually cheat on me. I understand that sounds harsh, but that is what would happen. I know she cares about me and would go to great lengths to conceal her adultery, but I'd know. How couldn't I? If she got laid, she'd stop climbing walls, and I'd notice. Rob, I love her. The woman is my life. If I didn't have her, I would simply die. And there is the problem... If she cheated behind my back, I couldn't live with her. I don't know why she did it, and I could understand why she did it. But I couldn't deal with the dishonesty. The only remedy, as far as I could see, was to have it happen in the open. But Tanya isn't the type of lady who would consent to bring a boyfriend into the bedroom while I sat in the living room and watched TV while she screwed. She could possibly have done it with a stranger in a motel room without my knowledge. But she couldn't just date one person and then another the next week, and so on. What we needed was someone reliable, someone we both loved and felt comfortable with. We sat down and produced a list of potential candidates, but were unable to settle on anyone. We kept coming back to you, but we were worried that if we started with you and then Peg returned home, it would come to an end and we would have to start over, with Peg eventually returning to you. Everyone who knows Adam White knows he's a dipshit a-hole and Peg would quickly discover this and return home to you, safe in the knowledge that you had no idea what she was doing. I'm not sure why she thinks you're so foolish. I can only suppose that she believes you love her so much that you would never suspect she is up to something. I chuckled at that. 
she pretty much read me correctly because that is how things happened. And it wasn't until the separation had dragged on for so long that I realized something was wrong. Now that you know, and I know even if Peg doesn't, she is history. I know you won't accept her back under any circumstances that would allow Tanya and me to approach you. Tanya and I want a child, Rob. Tanya requires a consistent sex life. And until the physicians can identify and treat my problem, she will have to rely on others to give her with a sexual life. I know it sounds ridiculous, but you're making love to me. My wife is going to save our marriage. You just have to get used to the fact that I know and am fine with it. I wasn't sure what to say. The whole incident was so bizarre that even though it had happened before, I still couldn't believe it. Tom gazed down into his glass before looking up at me and saying, It kills me not to be able to care for my wife, Rob, but it would kill me to lose her. I need you to handle this for me, but I actually do. Can I count on you? I glanced at him for a few seconds before nodding. Yes. On Sunday, I welcomed Tom, Tanya, and three other couples over for a BBQ. After the other couples had left, Tom went into the den to play on my computer while Tanya and I walked upstairs to my bedroom. Tanya was laying on the bed by the time I had undressed, urging me to hurry up and get to my place. Tanya. And in my home and on my bed. We do things my way. I propped her legs up on my shoulders so gravity could assist my tiny men in their race to her core in pursuit of Iraq. After about 30 seconds, I ordered her to place a pillow under her bum and then put her legs down. Tanya looked up at me and added, Peggy walked away from this. The woman must be insane or foolish after that stroke. To my ego, I simply had to justify it. So I swung over her in a missionary pose. And as she responded, no, Rob, I had to do my job. I laughed and added, if there's any left around the opening, it's not going anywhere. Five minutes later, I was driving deep into her for the second time. When Tom mentioned Tanya being highly sexual, I could see he knew what he was talking about. She got a third time out of me before I led her and Tom to their car. Tom shook my hand, and Tanya kissed my cheek. We all agreed that the day was a success and that we should do it again soon. Anyone watching would assume we were discussing the grill. Monday afternoon, I visited with John Abbott of the Corless Agency, and as he handed me the report, he remarked, I apologize. Every time I do one of these things, I hope it's just a misunderstanding and nothing is going wrong. However, there is no dispute here. Your price includes our court attendance on your behalf, if what you decide to do is put to trial. I shook his hand and left his office, and on the way home I wasn't as outraged as I expected. It was probably because I had already accepted that it was true, and by the time I received the report, I had resolved everything in my mind. What was I going to do in this situation? Nothing I hadn't already done. The only thing left for me to do was time the draw on the house line of credit— so Peg would not notice until it was too late. I'd see an attorney and have the papers prepared up, but I wouldn't have them served until I was ready, over the following five weeks. I visited Tom and Tanya three or four times per week, either at their home or mine. They spread the word that I was going through a tough period and that they were spending time with me to cheer me up. I received my weekly phone call from Peg, but I stopped asking how she was doing and when she would be home. I finally had enough. I wrote checks against the line of credit, and as soon as they cleared, I found an apartment and left the house. And had Peg served with divorce papers, they cited irreconcilable differences rather than adultery. I did it that way, so Peg would know I knew about White. She would take it as an attempt to get her to come home. She would contact me, give me a line about how I was overreacting, and then offer that we meet somewhere for a drink and dinner so she could try to calm me down and talk some sense into me. I would agree to meet with her, listen to her, and then say I'd think about it. It would buy me several days until the line of credit checks cleared and I could empty out my bank and savings accounts. It went just how I expected. First, I received a phone call telling me that I was being unreasonable and that I didn't need to hire counsel. I told her I was tired of the neither fish nor fowl predicament. You do not want to be with me. Thus, it is time for me to accept this and move on with my life. I arranged to meet her at Angelo's. It was the first time I had seen her since she left me, and she looked great. I was going to miss her, and I did miss her because I knew I still loved her. But even if she returned to me, I knew I would never be able to live with her again. I didn't tell her that, however. Instead, I sat there and listened while she fed me a load of nonsense. 
She was seeing an analyst and helping Peg comprehend, blah, 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 and Peg was making good progress. All she needed was some more time. I know it's hard on you, sweetie, but it's also hard on me. Please, baby, just a bit more time. I told her I'd think about it and let her know. I waited two days before calling my attorney and telling them it was time to take the next step. He annulled the divorce papers and notified Peg that the file had been canceled. Peg called me at work to thank me and assure me that I would not regret it. I grinned, knowing I didn't regret anything, but she didn't understand why. However, she would soon find out. That night I had supper with Tom and Tanya's, and after dinner Tanya and I went to her bedroom where Tanya spread herself for me and asked, Can we make love tonight, rather than screwing? I want to make love to my child's father. Are you certain? Positive. The home test indicated Tuesday, and the doctor confirmed that this afternoon. You were going to be a dad. We only tried it once that night. But it was a long, leisurely, and really fulfilling experience. When it was ended, I warned her it might be a while before we met again. I'm going to finish the forest with Peg and White this week, and I might have to leave town for a bit. Don't do something dramatic, lover. I'll need the father of my baby to be present. That would be Tom. Sweetie, you should start thinking like that. Do you understand what I mean, lover? Just because I am Brad doesn't mean I won't need you anymore. Adam White was a member of the Fraternal Order of Eagles, and since being chosen sergeant at arms, he had never missed a meeting. He left that Wednesday's meeting in a good mood, having spoken with several of the more powerful members and believing he had a strong chance of running for higher office in the order. He was in a good mood when he got out of his automobile in the parking lot of his condominium. He locked his car door, turned, and experienced searing anguish before everything went black. A neighbor discovered him and called 911, and the paramedics who responded brought him to the hospital's emergency room, where it was discovered that both of his arms and legs were shattered. In addition, his vaginal area was severely damaged, necessitating the removal of both testicles. He was in excruciating pain when he opened his eyes and realized he was in a hospital ward and couldn't move. He wore casts on his limbs and legs and was in traction. He saw Peggy standing next to his bed, scared, before fading out again. I wasn't present at the time, but I was given a detailed account of what transpired when the man entered the room and approached Peg, who was standing next to the bed and staring down at White. When she replied that she was Margaret Olson, the man handed her some documents and informed her that she had been served. She looked perplexed as she opened the letter and discovered that she was being sued for divorce. Only this time, the reason was infidelity. She looked at the word infidelity, then at the disaster laying on the bed in front of her, and her face turned pale and scared as she realized what it meant. She groaned, oh God. Then she sat down on a chair and began crying. I hung around long enough for the cops to question where I was that night. It turns out I was at a poker game that began an hour before the Eagles meeting and ended an hour after Wyatt was admitted to the hospital. Peg paid for my alibi, though she didn't realize it. The guy supported me and would have done it for free. But the goal of the exercise was to stick it to Peg, so I used her credit to express my gratitude. Home Shopping Network collected her Visa card information for the digital cameras I supplied Bill and Steve. eBay billed her MasterCard for the laptop. I gave Mike the 19-inch flat-screen monitor that I had given Phil. She even paid for the aluminum baseball bat. I was scheduled for six weeks of vacation and three weeks of comp time, and I also took a two-month leave of absence. And when the cops were sure that I had nothing to do with White's misfortune, they proved it. Anyway, I arranged to leave town and go fishing in Mexico. Before I departed, I told my attorney not to rush the divorce and instead wait until Peg started fighting it before dropping it. We'd remain married, but I'd have nothing to do with her. I called Tom and Tanya once a week to see how things were going, and they told me that Peg had moved back into the house, and as far as anyone could tell, true love must not have been in the cards for Peg and White because she never went back to see him after the day she was served while standing next to his, the maxed-out credit card bills must have begun to arrive in her mailbox, and she must have discovered that her savings and checking accounts were depleted. The line of credit was fixed, and the CDs in the bank deposit box were false because the next thing I heard was that Peg was desperately trying to find me 
and no one could tell her where I was. When she called in to find me, my employer, who knew the whole incident, informed her that I had left. He informed her that I had only come in one day, announced my departure, and requested my check. Essentially, he led her to assume that I had quit without notice. He did not tell her that, but he did make her believe it. A call to my attorney, insisting that he schedule a meeting with me, provided her with the information I had dropped. The divorce action paid him off, and he no longer represents me. She had no choice. Four months after I left on my fishing trip, she declared bankruptcy. She lost her house and had to give up her Lexus to start driving. It used to go. When I heard that, I returned from Mexico, found an apartment on the other side of town from where Peg lived, and tried to avoid locations where she may see me. Tanya was five months pregnant and looked sexier than any woman should be, so we continued where we left off. This time, however, we did not have to worry about someone keeping an eye on me. And two or three times a week, she or I would spend the night at each other's apartment. I returned two months before Peg found out, and one day when I got off work, I discovered her waiting in the parking lot for me. She got out of her car and approached me, but I ignored her, got into my car, and drove out of the lot. I noticed her hurrying to her car in the rearview mirror, so I slowed down so she could keep me inside. I'd have it out with her, but not in the parking lot of work. I maintained a speed that she could easily follow. About ten minutes later, I pulled into the parking lot at Bud's Bar and Grill. I was inside by the time she parked, and I was sitting at the bar ordering a Bud Light. She came in, glanced around, saw me, and approached me. She was already mouthing off as she approached. Don't think you can escape me, you scum sucker. I understand, Peg. And so I knew what she was going to do. And I turned around on the seat, cornering my wrist as she swung at my head. I gripped as hard as I could and she gasped in pain while I sat. I have every reason to desire to hurt you, Peg, so please don't push me too far. You keep your hands to yourself unless you want to experience serious pain. I let go of her wrist and replied, I wasn't fleeing from you. I drove slowly so you could follow me here. I was not going to air your dirty laundry in the parking lot where I work. It doesn't matter here because everyone already knows if you're a three or four. I want to chat to you. I do not want to talk to you. I've already heard enough of your falsehoods. I want to get my money back. What would that cost, Peg? You owe me the money you borrowed against the house, and I owned half of everything else we had. And I want it. Well, Peg, you're not going to get it. My perspective on the situation is that it was reparation for what you did to me. What do lawyers say when suing? Compensation for grief, suffering, and the loss of conjugal rights. I feel what I gained nearly compensates for the anguish and suffering I endured for going without sex for a year and a half while you were giving it away to someone else, as well as the humiliation I experienced as everyone I knew looked at me as a foolish cock. Damn you, Rob. I lost my parents' home because of you. Big deal, Peg. It couldn't have meant much to you because, as I recall, you moved out to live with another man. I mean it, Rob. I want the money. Peggy, I have some news for you. You will never receive a dime of it from me. You tried to screw me over, but you got caught. I made you pay. Live with it. I guess we'll have to wait and see what the courts decide. It doesn't matter what they say, Peg. This is how it will operate. You will need to hire a lawyer and sue me for divorce to get me into court so that the court can issue an order dividing assets. As soon as you sue, I will countersue. A good lawyer can delay things for six to eight months, during which time you will be paying your lawyer. Can you afford to pay him to receive nothing? I have enough proof to fight you in court, and if I win, you'll get it in the bomb. The worst-case situation for me is being ordered to share the assets. I say, okay, judge, and exit the courtroom. You and your lawyer. Wait, wait and wait for the money. But the money never arrives. You call but I don't answer. So your lawyer, whom you are still paying, goes back to court and obtains a court order directing me to pay by such and such date. You and the lawyer. Wait and wait. And by the deadline, you still haven't received a cent from me. Your lawyer keeps paying you for his time, returns to court, and obtains a judgment against me. I do not have any savings or bank accounts that can be connected. My automobile is leased, so there's nothing for you there. I live in a furnished flat, so there's nothing to get. All you can do with your verdict is garnish my pay. And the first time I receive a garnished paycheck, I will quit my work. So, what do we have here, Peg? A solid year's worth of legal bills out of your own pocket, and all four, possibly dollar two hundred out of one paycheck. 
All you have to do now is go back to the judge and threaten me with jail time for contempt of court if I do not follow his commands. All you'll get, Peg, is a postcard from me from some small fishing village in Mexico, where I'll stay till my money runs out. And I have a lot, Peg. Thank you. Face it, Peggy. You screwed me over, got caught, and I got even. Consider yourself fortunate. Think about what happened to your lover, and consider yourself really fortunate. He lost his balls, and now he can never mess with another man's wife. You, on the other hand, can still spread for whomever you choose. I knew it. I knew you were involved in Adam's situation. What you believe you know and what you can verify are two entirely different things, Peg. By the way, how is your love affair going? According to what I understand, you haven't seen the poor man since his first day in the hospital. What was the point of taking away the one thing he had going for him? That's cold, Peg. Even for you. This is the truth. He was wonderfully endowed, and he was an excellent lover. But I'd get weary of him soon and return home. Peg, I wish I had known that all of the unhappiness might have been prevented. If only I had known that you would eventually return to me. Damn. I guess based on my conduct, I messed up, didn't I? I'll have to carry that regret to the grave. What a joy life may have been if we had communicated more effectively. You can be such a jerk. Yes, Peggy, and you're a useless cheat. Three or four. I drank my beer and remarked to Peg, Have a rotten life. And I left the bar. Three days later, I received divorce papers, alleging irreconcilable differences. I did not contest it, so she received half of the marital assets and I was compelled to repay the money borrowed against the line of credit. I wished her luck in getting anything and discarded the final decree. She must have believed me when I told her how things would go, because I never heard from her again. One intriguing thing emerged out of the situation. Everyone was agreed that White was a dipshit a-hole. Even dipshit a-holes can have a few friends. And one of White's was Peggy's boss. He was unhappy with how she treated White following his misfortune. And he fired her. Well, fired isn't the way it was put. A downturn in the economy necessitated a downsizing and Peggy was let go. But everyone knew that she was fired. She couldn't find job in our area, so she traveled to California, where she had some relatives, and no one, not even her sister, has heard from her since. There is one more chapter to the story. It was a sad ending, but at the same time, a glorious beginning. Tanya had a beautiful baby girl, and Tom doted on her and spoiled her rotten. Uncle Rob was a constant visitor and spent many, many hours crawling around on the floor with little Martha. Tom never told Tanya or me the full story. He knew why he had erectile dysfunction, but he hid it from Tanya. He had cancer and it didn't get caught in time. And the cancer spread. Following his funeral, Tanya handed me an envelope addressed to me. It was addressed to me and written across the front of the envelope were the words for Rob's eyes only. I looked at her and she shrugged and said, I have no idea it is addressed to you. So I haven't seen what's inside. I opened it and read, Hey, but if you were reading this, I'm gone. There was a reason I picked you. Yes, it was me, not Tanya. The father. Our. I knew I wouldn't be there for them. And I wanted someone I knew I could trust to be around to watch over them. I knew I could count on you. So you got elected. Don't let me down by it. Take good care of our girls. I handed the letter to Tanya and she read it and started crying. I took her in my arms to comfort her. And when she was all cried out, she asked me what I was going to do. I'm going to do just what he knew I would do. I'm going to take care of my girls. Six months later, Tanya and I were married. Thank you for taking the time to hear today's story. If you enjoyed the article, please like and subscribe if you have not already. If you have a story to offer about your own or someone else's situation, please do not hesitate to contact me. Take care.